Chapter Five of *The Mysterious Stranger* by Mark Twain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. *The Mysterious Stranger* by Mark Twain. Chapter Five. On the fourth day comes the astrologer from his crumbling old tower up the valley, where he had heard the news, I reckon. He had a private talk with us, and we told him what we could, for we were mightily in dread of him. He sat there studying and studying a while to himself. Then he asked, How many ducats did you say? Eleven hundred and seven, sir. Then he said, as if he were talking to himself, "'It is very singular, yes, very strange, a curious coincidence.' Then he began to ask questions, and went over the whole ground from the beginning, we answering. By and by he said, eleven hundred and six ducats. It is a large sum.' Seven, said Seppi, correcting him. "'Oh, seven, was it?' Of course, a ducat more or less isn't of consequence, but you said eleven hundred and six before. It would not have been safe for us to say he was mistaken, but we knew he was. Nicholas said, We ask pardon for the mistake, but we meant to say seven. Oh, it is no matter, lad. It was merely that I noticed the discrepancy. It is several days, and you cannot be expected to remember precisely. One is apt to be inexact when there is no particular circumstance to impress the count upon the memory. But there was one, sir, said Seppi eagerly. What was it, my son? asked the astrologer indifferently. First we all counted the piles of coin each in turn, and all made it the same, eleven hundred and six. But I had slipped one out for fun when the count began, and now I slipped it back and said, I think there is a mistake. There are eleven hundred and seven. Let us count again. We did, and of course I was right. They were astonished. Then I told you how it came about. The astrologer asked us if this was so, and we said it was. That settles it, he said. I know the thief now. Lads, the money was stolen. Then he went away, leaving us very much troubled and wondering what he could mean. In about an hour we found out, for by that time it was all over the village, that Father Peter had been arrested for stealing a great sum of money from the astrologer. Everybody's tongue was loose and going. Many said it was not in Father Peter's character and must be a mistake. But the others shook their heads and said misery and want could drive a suffering man to almost anything. About one detail there were no differences. All agreed that Father Peter's account of how the money came into his hands was just about unbelievable. It had such an impossible look. They said it might have come into the astrologer's hands in some such way, but into Father Peter's never. Our characters began to suffer now. We were Father Peter's only witnesses. How much did he probably pay us to back up his fantastic tale? People talked that kind of talk to us pretty freely and frankly, and we were full of scoffings when we begged them to believe really we had told only the truth. Our parents were harder on us than anyone else. Our fathers said we were disgracing our families, and they commanded us to purge ourselves of our lie, and there was no limit to their anger when we continued to say we had spoken true. Our mothers cried over us, and begged us to give back our bribe, and get back our honest names, and save our families from shame, and come out and honorably confess. And at last we were so worried and harassed that we tried to tell the whole thing, Satan and all, but no, it wouldn't come out. We were hoping and longing all the time that Satan would come and help us out of our trouble, but there was no sign of him. Within an hour after the astrologer's talk with us, Father Peter was in prison, and the money sealed up and in the hands of the officers of the law. The money was in a bag, and Solomon Isaacs said he had not touched it since he had counted it. 
his oath was taken that it was the same money, and that the amount was eleven hundred and seven ducats. Father Peter claimed trial by the ecclesiastical court, but our other priest, Father Adolf, said an ecclesiastical court hadn't jurisdiction over a suspended priest. The bishop upheld him. That settled it. The case would go to trial in the civil court. The court would not sit for some time to come. Wilhelm Meidling would be Father Peter's lawyer, and do the best he could, of course, but he told us privately that a weak case on his side, and all the power and prejudice on the other, made the outlook bad. So Margaret's new happiness died a quick death. No friends came to condole with her, and none were expected. An unsigned note withdrew her invitation to the party. There would be no scholars to take lessons. How could she support herself? She could remain in the house, for the mortgage was paid off, though the government and not poor Solomon Isaacs had the mortgage money in its grip for the present. Old Ursula, who was cook, chambermaid, housekeeper, laundress, and everything else for Father Peter, and had been Margaret's nurse in earlier years, said God would provide. But she said that from habit, for she was a good Christian. She meant to help in the providing, to make sure if she could find a way. We boys wanted to go and see Margaret, and show friendliness for her, but our parents were afraid of offending the community, and wouldn't let us. The astrologer was going around inflaming everybody against Father Peter, and saying he was an abandoned thief, and had stolen eleven hundred and seven gold ducats from him. He said he knew he was a thief from that fact, for it was exactly the sum he had lost, and which Father Peter pretended he had found. In the afternoon of the fourth day after the catastrophe, old Ursula appeared at our house, and asked for some washing to do, and begged my mother to keep this secret, to save Margaret's pride, who would stop this project if she found it out. Yet Margaret had not enough to eat, and was growing weak. Ursula was growing weak herself, and showed it, and she ate of the food that was offered her like a starving person, but could not be persuaded to carry any home, for Margaret would not eat charity food. She took some clothes down to the stream to wash them, but we saw from the window that handling the bat was too much for her strength, so she was called back and a trifle of money offered her, which she was afraid to take lest Margaret should suspect. Then she took it, saying she would explain that she found it in the road. To keep it from being a lie and damning her soul, she got me to drop it while she watched. Then she went along by there and found it, and exclaimed with surprise and joy, and picked it up and went her way. Like the rest of the village, she could tell every day lies fast enough, and without taking any precautions against fire and brimstone on their account. But this was a new kind of lie, and it had a dangerous look, because she hadn't had any practice in it. After a week's practice it wouldn't have given her any trouble. It is the way we are made. I was in trouble, for how would Margaret live? Ursula could not find a coin in the road every day, perhaps not even a second one. And I was ashamed, too, for not having been near Margaret, and she so in need of friends. But that was my parents' fault, not mine, and I couldn't help it. I was walking along the path, feeling very downhearted, when a most cheery and tingling freshening-up sensation went rippling through me, and I was too glad for any words, for I knew by that sign that Satan was by. I had noticed it before. Next moment he was alongside of me, and I was telling him all my trouble and what had been happening to Margaret and her uncle. While we were talking, we turned a curve and saw old Ursula resting in the shade of a tree and she had a lean stray kitten in her lap and was petting it. I asked her where she got it, and she said it came out of the woods and followed her, and she said it probably hadn't any mother or any friends, and she was going to take it home and take care of it. Satan said, I understand you are very poor. Why do you want to add another mouth to feed? Why don't you give it to some rich person? Ursula bridled at this and said, Perhaps you would like to have it. You must be rich, with your fine clothes and quality airs. Then she sniffed and said, Give it to the rich, the idea. The rich don't care for anybody but themselves. It is only the poor that have feeling for the poor and help them. 
the poor, and God, God will provide for this kitten. What makes you think so? Ursula's eyes snapped with anger. Because I know it, she said. Not a sparrow falls to the ground without his seeing it. But it falls just the same. What good is seeing it fall? Old Ursula's jaws worked, but she could not get any word out for the moment. She was so horrified. When she got her tongue, she stormed out. Go about your business, you puppy, or I will take a stick to you. I could not speak. I was so scared. I knew that with his notions about the human race, Satan would consider it a matter of no consequence to strike her dead, there being plenty more. But my tongue stood still. I could give her no warning. But nothing happened. Satan remained tranquil, tranquil and indifferent. I suppose he could not be insulted by Ursula any more than the king could be insulted by a tumble-bug. The old woman jumped to her feet when she made her remark, and did it as briskly as a young girl. It had been many years since she had done the like of that. That was Satan's influence. He was a fresh breeze to the weak and sick wherever he came. His presence affected even the lean kitten, and it skipped to the ground and began to chase a leaf. This surprised Ursula, and she stood looking at the creature and nodding her head wonderingly, her anger quite forgotten. "'What's come over it?' she said. "'A while ago it could hardly walk.' "'You have not seen a kitten of that breed before,' said Satan. Ursula was not proposing to be friendly with the mocking stranger, and she gave him an ungentle look and retorted, "'Who asked you to come here and pester me, I'd like to know? And what do you know about what I've seen and what I haven't seen?' "'You haven't seen a kitten with the hair spines on its tongue pointing to the front, have you?' "'No, nor you, either. Well, examine this one and see.' Ursula was becoming pretty spry, but the kitten was spryer, and she could not catch it and had to give it up. Then Satan said, "'Give it a name, and maybe it will come.' Ursula tried several names, but the kitten was not interested. "'Call it Agnes.' Try that. The creature answered to the name and came. Ursula examined its tongue. Upon my word, it's true, she said. I have not seen this kind of a cat before. Is it yours? No. Then how did you know its name so pat? Because all cats of that breed are named Agnes. They will not answer to any other. Ursula was impressed. It is the most wonderful thing. Then a shadow of trouble came into her face, for her superstitions were aroused, and she reluctantly put the creature down, saying, I suppose I must let it go. I am not afraid, no, not exactly that, though the priest, well, I've heard people, indeed many people, and besides it is quite well now and can take care of itself. She sighed and turned to go, murmuring, It is such a pretty one, too, and would be such company and the house is so sad and lonesome these troubled days. Miss Margaret's so mournful and just a shadow, and the old master shut up in jail. It seems a pity not to keep it, said Satan. Ursula turned quickly, just as if she were hoping someone would encourage her. Why? she asked wistfully. Because this breed brings luck. Does it? Is it true? Young man, do you know it to be true? How does it bring luck? Well, it brings money, anyway. Ursula looked disappointed. Money. A cat bring money? <laughs> the idea. You could never sell it here. People do not buy cats here. One can't even give them away. She turned to go. I don't mean sell it. I mean have an income from it. This kind is called the lucky cat. Its owner finds four silver groschen in his pocket every morning. I saw the indignation rising in the old woman's face. She was insulted. This boy was making fun of her. That was her thought. She thrust her hands into her pockets and straightened up to give him a piece of her mind. Her temper was all up and hot. Her mouth came open and let out three words of a bitter sentence. Then it fell silent and the anger in her face turned to surprise, or wonder, or fear, or something, 
and she slowly brought out her hands from her pockets, and opened them, and held them so. In one was my piece of money, in the other lay four silver groschen. She gazed a little while, perhaps to see if the groschen would vanish away. Then she said fervently, It's true, it's true, and I'm ashamed, and beg forgiveness, O oh dear master and benefactor. And she ran to Satan, and kissed his hand over and over again, according to the Austrian custom. In her heart she probably believed it was a witch-cat, and an agent of the devil. But no matter, it was all the more certain to be able to keep its contract, and furnish a daily good living for the family, for in matters of finance even the piousest of our peasants would have more confidence in an arrangement with the devil than with an archangel. Ursula started homeward with Agnes in her arms, and I said I wished I had her privilege of seeing Margaret. Then I caught my breath, for we were there, there in the parlour, and Margaret standing, looking at us, astonished. She was feeble and pale, but I knew that those conditions would not last in Satan's atmosphere, and it turned out so. I introduced Satan, that is, Philip Trum, and we sat down and talked. There was no constraint. We were simple folk in our village, and when a stranger was a pleasant person we were soon friends. Margaret wondered how we got in without her hearing us. Trom said the door was open, and we walked in and waited until she would turn around and greet us. This was not true. No door was open. We entered through the walls or the roof or down the chimney or somehow, but no matter what Satan wished a person to believe, the person was sure to believe, and so Margaret was quite satisfied with that explanation. And then the main part of her mind was on Trom anyway. She couldn't keep her eyes off him. He was so beautiful. That gratified me and made me proud. I hoped he would show off some. But he didn't. He seemed only interested in being friendly and telling lies. He said he was an orphan. That made Margaret pity him. The water came into her eyes. He said he had never known his mamma. She passed away while he was a young thing, and said his papa was in shattered health and had no property to speak of, in fact none of any earthly value. But he had an uncle in business down in the tropics, and he was very well off and had a monopoly, and it was from this uncle that he drew his support. The very mention of a kind uncle was enough to remind Margaret of her own, and her eyes filled again. She said she hoped their two uncles would meet some day. It made me shudder. Philip said he hoped so, too, and that made me shudder again. "'Maybe they will,' said Margaret. Does your uncle travel much? Oh, yes, he goes all about. He has business everywhere. And so they went on chatting, and poor Margaret forgot her sorrow for one little while anyway. It was probably the only really bright and cheery hour she had known lately. I saw she liked Philip, and I knew she would. And when he told her he was studying for the ministry, I could see that she liked him better than ever. And then, when he promised to get her admitted to the jail, so that she could see her uncle, that was the capstone. He said he would give the guards a little present, and she must always go in the evening after dark and say nothing, but just show this paper and pass in, and show it again when you come out. And he scribbled some queer marks on the paper and gave it to her, and she was ever so thankful, and right away was in a fever for the sun to go down, for in that old cruel time prisoners were not allowed to see their friends, and sometimes they spent years in the jails without ever seeing a friendly face. I judged that the marks on the paper were an enchantment, and that the guards would not know what they were doing, nor have any memory of it afterward, and that was indeed the way of it. Ursula put her head in at the door now, and said, "'Supper's ready, miss.' Then she saw us, and looked frightened, and motioned me to come to her, which I did, and she asked if we had told about the cat. I said no, and she was relieved, and said, "'Please don't, for if Miss Margaret knew, she would think it was an unholy cat, and would send for a priest, and have its gifts all purified out of it, and then there wouldn't be any more dividends.' So I said we wouldn't tell, and she was satisfied." Then I was beginning to say good-bye to Margaret, but Satan interrupted and said ever so politely, well, I don't remember just the words, 
but anyway he as good as invited himself to supper, and me too. Of course Margaret was miserably embarrassed, for she had no reason to suppose there would be half enough for a sick bird. Ursula heard him, and she came straight into the room, not a bit pleased. At first she was astonished to see Margaret looking so fresh and rosy, and said so. Then she spoke up in her native tongue, which was Bohemian, and said, as I learned afterward, "'Send him away, Miss Margaret. There's not victuals enough.' Before Margaret could speak, Satan had the word, and was talking back to Ursula in her own language, which was a surprise to her, and for her mistress, too. He said, "'Didn't I see you down the road a while ago?' "'Yes, sir. Ah, that pleases me. I see you remember me.' He stepped to her and whispered, "'I told you it is a lucky cat. Don't be troubled. It will provide.' That sponged the slate of Ursula's feelings clean of its anxieties, and a deep financial joy shone in her eyes. The cat's value was augmenting. It was getting full time for Margaret to take some sort of notice of Satan's invitation, and she did it in the best way, the honest way, that was natural to her. She said she had little to offer, but that we were welcome if we would share it with her. We had supper in the kitchen, and Ursula waited at table. A small fish was in the frying-pan, crisp and brown and tempting, and one could see that Margaret was not expecting such respectable food as this. Ursula brought it, and Margaret divided it between Satan and me, declining to take any of it herself, and was beginning to say she did not care for fish to-day, but she did not finish the remark. It was because she noticed that another fish had appeared in the pan. She looked surprised, but did not say anything. She probably meant to inquire of Ursula about this later. There were other surprises, flesh, and game, and wines, and fruits, things which had been strangers in that house lately. But Margaret made no exclamations, and now even looked unsurprised, which was Satan's influence, of course. Satan talked right along and was entertaining, and made the time pass pleasantly and cheerfully, and although he told a good many lies, it was no harm in him, for he was only an angel and did not know any better. They do not know right from wrong. I knew this, because I remembered what he had said about it. He got on the good side of Ursula. He praised her to Margaret confidentially, but speaking just loud enough for Ursula to hear. He said she was a fine woman, and he hoped some day to bring her and his uncle together. Very soon Ursula was mincing and simpering around in a ridiculous girly way, and smoothing out her gown, and prinking at herself like a foolish old hen, and all the time pretending she was not hearing what Satan was saying. I was ashamed, for it showed us to be what Satan considered us, a silly race, and trivial. Satan said his uncle entertained a great deal, and to have a clever woman presiding over the festivities would double the attractions of the place. "'But your uncle is a gentleman, isn't he?' asked Margaret. "'Yes,' said Satan indifferently. "'Some even call him a prince, out of compliment. But he is not bigoted. To him personal merit is everything. Rank, nothing.' My hand was hanging down by my chair. Agnes came along and licked it. By this act a secret was revealed. I started to say, it is all a mistake. This is just a common, ordinary cat. The hair-needles on her tongue point inward, not outward. But the words did not come, because they couldn't. Satan smiled upon me, and I understood. When it was dark, Margaret took food and wine and fruit in a basket, and hurried away to the jail, and Satan and I walked toward my home. I was thinking to myself that I should like to see what the inside of the jail was like. Satan overheard that thought, and the next moment we were in the jail. We were in the torture chamber, Satan said. The rack was there, and the other instruments, and there was a smoky lantern or two hanging on the walls, and helping to make the place look dim and dreadful. There were people there, and executioners, but as they took no notice of us it meant that we were invisible. A young man lay bound, and Satan said he was suspected of being a heretic, and the executioners were about to inquire into it. They asked the man to confess to the charge, and he said he could not, for it was not true. Then they drove splinter after splinter under his nails, and he shrieked with the pain. Satan was not disturbed, but I could not endure it, and had to be whisked out of there. 
I was faint and sick, but the fresh air revived me, and we walked toward my home. I said it was a brutal thing. No, it was a human thing. You should not insult the brutes by such a misuse of that word. They have not deserved it. And he went on talking like that. It is like your poultry race, always lying, always claiming virtues which it hasn't got, always denying them to the higher animals, which alone possess them. No brute ever does a cruel thing. That is a monopoly of those with the moral sense. When a brute inflicts pain, he does it innocently. It is not wrong. For him there is no such thing as wrong. And he does not inflict pain for the pleasure of inflicting it. Only man does that, inspired by that mongrel moral sense of his, a sense whose function is to distinguish between right and wrong, with liberty to choose which of them he will do. Now what advantage can he get out of that? He is always choosing, and in nine cases out of ten he prefers the wrong. There shouldn't be any wrong, and without the moral sense there couldn't be any. And yet he is such an unreasoning creature that he is not able to perceive that the moral sense degrades him to the bottom layer of animated beings, and is a shameful possession. Are you feeling better? Let me show you something. End chapter 5 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Mysterious Stranger by Mark Twain, read for you by Ted DeLorme, in Fort Mill, South Carolina, during March 2008.